Today will be a day of taking stock, of celebrating what we've achieved so far and of setting our sights for the next part of the year. Thanks to the programming skills of the wonderful Rosha Goen, we have a jam-packed event for you today, so I'm going to be very brief. This feels like the right place to be. The Irish Times described the old Liberty Hall 100 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, 100 years ago as the centre of social anarchy, the brain of every riot and disturbance. While I think the intense planning, strategising and coordinating that's been going on since the start of Waking the Feminists is a far cry from anarchy, I do think that you, as the supporters and activists of the campaign, have managed to stage the most dignified, powerful and effective riotous disturbance that the theatre in Ireland has ever seen. So like I said, this feels like the right place to be. Speaking about riotous disturbances, we're going to hear a bit about walls coming tumbling down. I'd like to invite onto the stage some of the members of Diva Voces. really want to thank them for that, also because I know a lot of them ran over on their lunch break to do that, so thank you very much. We may have only moved a few metres up the road since our last public meeting on November the 12th, but the Campaign for Equality for Women in Theatre has moved on much further than that. I'm going to give you a quick overview of where we stand at the moment. I'm sure I've missed things out, it's a little hard to keep up. Firstly, I'd like to recap on the three key objectives we're all working towards. They are a sustained policy for inclusion with an action plan and measurable results, equal championing and advancement of women artists, and economic parity for all working in the theatre. Since we met in November, those of us who are working to advance these objectives have formed a loose organising group that meets weekly. We're open to hard-working newcomers. I've been told to tell you as well that it's also sometimes fun. <laughs> We've Committed to working on the campaign for a year, and after this meeting today, we'll be planning out a detailed strategy for the coming months. As you may know, the campaign has resonated widely, and I like to think that we've done some work in reclaiming the word, the F word, as a positive one, encouraging more women and men to identify as feminists. Waking the Feminists has already joined the lexicon of how we talk about culture and how we talk about women in this country and it's referenced in the media on an almost daily basis. Last week saw the first official meeting of Waking the Feminist, 
waking the feminist supporters. You'd think I'd be able to say it by now. <laughs> uh, in the Irish Arts Centre in New York, organised by the playwright Lisa Tierney Kyo, one day after an academic symposium titled Waking the Feminists at Fordham University, also in New York. On the 6th of January, following a call from us for supporters to gather on Nalagnaman, there were 14 separate Waking the Feminist inspired events that we know of across Ireland from Phoenix Park to the Aran Islands and two in New York. We've been in touch with a number of sister organizations and campaigns in Ireland and across the world, ones that are fighting similar fights in the arts and in other sectors. Ones such as the Equity in Theatre campaign in Canada, the Statera Foundation and the Lilly Awards in the US, Women and in Theatre and Screen in Australia, and the recently formed Equal Representation for Actresses group in the UK. Closer to home, we've become members of the National Women's Council of Ireland and have been in touch with Women for Election, Women on Air, Women in Film and Television, Women Allowed Northern Ireland, and Irish Equity, amongst others. If you didn't know, Irish Equity are currently conducting a survey on bullying and harassment in the theatre workplace that I really urge everybody to fill in on their website. You don't have to be an Equity member. There is a small Waking the Feminists team who are now planning how, to, how best to gather statistics on gender balance in our sector over the past 10 years. Unless we know how things have been, how can we measure any change? Thanks to the Irish Theatre Institute for their advice and support on this. We hope to be able to start publishing these statistics in the coming months. Everyone has been giving their time and resources for free. There's the start of a big thank you list on our website that I'm going to have to update significantly after today, as well as a list of the people who formed the Waking the Feminists organizing team. Without all that continuing support, the campaign wouldn't exist. I've been working nearly every spare minute on the campaign, but as a freelancer, of course, I can't keep this up indefinitely, though I'd like to. We've started fundraising to help support the campaign and its activities, such as the research, and also for a day and a half of my time per week for the rest of the year. We're going to talk a little bit about fundraising later. Our hope is to build our own obsolescence into the work that we're doing, empowering and encouraging companies and organizations to take on the responsibility of ensuring that they establish and maintain gender equality in what they do. On a side note, we've noticed sometimes there's an, a bit of confusion between equality and diversity. When we talk about gender equality, we talk about ensuring everyone has equal status, equal opportunities, and equal chance to use these opportunities to their full potential. Whereas diversity is more about recognizing, valuing, and including people with different backgrounds, knowledge, skills, and experiences. Equality and diversity are both important, though they're different and they're not interchangeable. While Waking the Feminists continues to push for gender equality and gender equality is what I'm talking about in this speech, we do urge organizations to use this opportunity to introduce both equality and diversity at a policy level. We've started to talk to the Arts Council about gender balance policy being a requirement for funding and Theatre Forum is looking into drafting templates. It's vital for policies like these to be put in place, but they can't just be a tick the box exercise. The ideology of gender equality needs to permeate the very fabric of the companies from top to bottom. This is about all areas of theatre. But it's not just about theatre. We have an opportunity for this sector to be seen as a trailblazer, for embracing change and championing gender equality in a way that can be used as a model and as a case study for others. Other sectors are watching us to see how we get on. Now is the time for us all to step up and do it. Representatives of Waking the Feminists have already met with the boards and directors of six key organisations. The Abbey, Druid, The Gate, Dublin Theatre Festival, Dublin Fringe Festival and Rough Magic. No mean feat in itself. We discussed how gender balance issues affect each of them and encouraged them to think about how they can take on leadership roles in the sector by examining their own structures and practices and beginning work to make improvements. In a few minutes, they, along with Project Arts Centre, will talk to you themselves about this. Those of you who watched the meeting at the Abbey will remember Lucy Kerbel of Tonic Theatre talking about the advanced programme she's been running with the top theatre organisations in the UK to, as she puts it, transform their aspirations for gender equality into reality. 
the advanced program has already yielded some extraordinary results. In 2014, Tonic Theatre worked with 11 organisations, including the RSC, the Young Vic, Sheffield Theatres, the Almeida and the Tricycle. By the end of that programme, for example, Sheffield Theatres pledged to have equal numbers of parts for male and female actors across its in-house productions. Tonic is just starting a second advanced programme with a cohort of organisations that include the National Theatre in London, who have already pledged to have gender equality by 2021 in terms of the directors and living writers that they employ. One of the great things about Advance is that it realises the impossibility of having a one-size-fits-all solution, which is something we feel very strongly about. Each organisation in Advance has its own idiosyncrasies. Each has a different role in the ecosystem of the theatre sector, so each needs to approach the question of gender equality differently. But the learning is shared, so there's less need to reinvent the wheel. If you're interested in finding out more, they do have a really great website that outlines the process and the findings of the first programme. We've been talking with Lucy Kerbel a lot, and she's ready and willing to set up an advanced programme in Ireland stay, starting later this year. We see this as a huge opportunity for the Irish theatre sector to avail of her knowledge, experience and expertise in this area. And an Irish advance programme is one of the legacies we'd like to leave from Waking the Feminists campaign. It's still early days. We introduced the idea to the seven organisations you're going to hear from shortly and set up meetings in the last month between each of them and Lucy. The meetings were positive and the door is open. We and they are in the middle of working out if and how an Irish advance programme could happen and who might take part. We're optimistic though the main sticking point is funding. Each of the participating organisations will be expected to buy into the programme, but to what degree and where any shortfall comes from is still to be worked out. But we will do our best to make sure it is worked out. This is not an opportunity to let slip by. That gives you a very fast overview of what we've been up to and where we stand. And in the immortal words of somebody or other, a lot done, more to do. Now, I would like to, I have to say this is a really great pleasure, I would like to invite the Abbey Theatre, Druid, Dublin Fringe Festival, Dublin Theatre Festival, The Gate Theatre, Project Arts Centre and Rough Magic to speak to you. Firstly, Loretta Dignam of the board of the Abbey Theatre. <laughs> Thanks, Lean. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to attend and to speak to you today on behalf of the Abbey Theatre at this public event on International Women's Day and to be a part of this very important national conversation. As a direct result of the Waking the Feminist movement and the historic public meeting on the 12th of November last year, the board of the Abbey Theatre established a gender equality subcommittee comprised of Deirdre Kinnahan, Neve Lunny, whom I know most of you already know, uh, Mark Ryan and I. I was appointed chair. Our remit is to develop a comprehensive gender equality policy and action plan for the Abbey Theatre. Since November the 12th last year, we've been hugely focused on the issue of gender equality. We've been engaging with a wide variety of stakeholders within the Abbey Theatre, the staff and the new incoming directors, and across the wider theatre and arts community in Ireland, in the UK and in the US. It has been a fascinating journey for all of us so far. We have learned many, many things, but one thing that we have learned is that this issue is complex and, require, and will require change in many areas simultaneously, from leadership to values and culture, from structures and processes to ways of working, and from measurement to evaluation and reporting. Such is the complexity and importance of this topic that we need to invest the time now and at this stage to get it right for now and for the future. So what point now is the Gender Equality Subcommittee of the Abbey Theatre? 
We are just about concluding our stakeholder engagement piece and are moving into drafting policy with the intention of sharing that with the board of the Abbey Theatre. And as you know, three of our uh, board members are state appointments. So we need to follow procedure and governance. But once we have sign off and agreement from the board, we will then move into implementation, into action. And we look forward to updating you all on our progress in due course. Thank you. Hello, I'm Roisin Stack. I'm a theatre maker and I also work with Druid. And today I'm speaking on Druid's behalf. Druid met with Waking the Feminists in December to discuss how we can better support the movement and examine our own practices in relation to gender inequality. We can't hold our hands up as a beacon of gender balance. While we pride ourselves on having a good balance across administration, staff and casting, our record on writers and directors is not so hot. Waking the Feminists has reminded us that we all have a responsibility to achieve equality for women, and the movement has given us extraordinary examples of how we can do this. This has been an incredibly liberating experience in and of itself, for which we at Druid are extremely grateful. Throughout its 40 years in existence, Druid has seen a lot of societal change, and this one is long overdue. Druid was born out of a desire to represent and express the West of Ireland. The founding members, Marie, Gary and Mick, didn't want to have to go somewhere else or be someone else to be taken seriously as artists. They staged things, the Playboy, the Western World, and established Ireland's first professional theatre company outside of Dublin. Druid recognises a similarity between that original impulse and today's struggle to be represented, to want to make work as yourself and not feel disadvantaged because of who you are. Referring to Singh, Yeats said, whenever a country produces a man of genius, that man is never like the country's idea of itself. Well, our country's had a lot of ideas about itself and not all of them have been good. Through this movement, we hope we produce more women of genius and more importantly, to better support the women we already have and to finally change this country's idea of itself once and for all. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Nelson, director of Tiger Dublin Fringe. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and happy International Women's Day. It's good to share how invigorated we at Fringe have been since Waking the Feminists took fire in November. In its 21 year history, Fringe has been one of the places where the country's leading women artists have made and continue to make indelible, unforgettable works. They've shaped, led, and defined the festival. In fact, I'd bet that many of this country's women artists can connect how they've carved out their career to the work that they've done at Fringe. While this has been true of the festival, it's not been true of the sector at large. And so giving a platform to underrepresented voices has been part of Fringe's DNA since the beginning. Equality has been part of the organization's history, sometimes in the way of direct interve interventions made by the festival, and sometimes as an indirect spirit of inclusion. And what's invigorating about right now is that the collective conversation inspired by Waking the Feminists has implored us all that even an indirect, implicit kind of equality is not enough. It's important now to be explicit. So let me happily and explicitly say that for Fringe, equality is something we work on. Equality is an agenda, and that agenda is wide ranging. We are actively seeking to program work by women, by trans artists, by artists of non-Irish backgrounds, by artists of color, by members of the traveler community, by artists with disabilities, by queer artists, and that goes for this year, for years past, and years in the future. We're advocating for our sector's drive for equality to encompass a broad definition of the term. We have to look at how practitioners in our field access opportunities, and if they're gender, race, class, disability, religion, language, cultural background, gives them equal opportunities or not. The move to make the Irish performing arts more equal can't stop at women and men. We have to bring everyone with us. Applications for this year's festival close in a few hours. 
you don't have time. As we program, we will be weighing considerations of representation and equality, and these will live alongside the other considerations on our agenda, those of excellence, readiness, rigor, potential, talent, timeliness, and singularity. Over this next month, we will choose which ideas and voices to amplify in Fringe 2016. It's not something we take lightly. It's an aesthetic and at times a personal process. We're guided by knowledge and instinct. We're not giving up on taste. And we're checking in on our blind spots. Blind spots. We are striving for a program that is artistically rigorous and inclusive of many voices. Our agenda is to prevent a festival full of compelling works made by singular artists. What they will make is important and who they are is important. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Willie White. I've been artistic director of Dublin Theatre Festival since 2011, and I've worked in Irish theatre for more than 20 years. So what can I say in two minutes? Firstly, I can say that I'm a feminist, and I believe in equality. I'm also a parent to two little boy feminists and a girl feminist for the next generation. <laughs> At Dublin Theatre Festival, we have followed the waking of the feminist movement since its inception. The issues raised have been the subject of lively discussion among our team, with our board, and in conversation with artists and stakeholders. Our executive and board also had a very positive meeting with Awaking the Feminists uh, early last month. The past few months have been very challenging and very invigorating for our sector. Irish theatre's image is so bound up in ideas of radicalism and interrogating identity that it has been sobering to consider that we have perpetuated rather than redressed inequality. The reasons for this are complex, but I think it's useful to try and see the problem really, really simply. As Joan Burton said at the Waking the Feminists event at Project Arts Centre in December, it's important to count. So we've been analysing our programme over the past decade. It offers a useful sample, including as it does the work of building-based organisations, independent companies, small and large-scale projects, and Irish and international artists across a range of contemporary theatre aesthetics. Beginning with directors, to reflect the route for most projects into the festival, the decade saw a ratio of female to male directors for single director projects of 32% to 68%, roughly one to two. There are nuances of scale and numbers of performances, but that's the headline information. The ratio of female to male writers is lower, worse, at 20% to 80%. Even allowing for an historically very masculine canon, there is clearly work to be done by all of us to increase the participation of living female writers and to create more opportunities for female directors. We are committed to changing the numbers, and this has been embraced by the governance of our organization. I'm in dialogue with our gender-balanced board, uh, the Council of Dublin Theatre Festival, members of which are themselves leading in, um, events for International Women's Day elsewhere today, about concrete measures we can undertake to advance the cause of gender equality in Irish theatre. One of the actions that we have identified is the need to create pathways to leadership for the next generation of artistic directors. Mindful of the fact that there's never been a, an artistic, a female artistic director of our organization, for example. We can see that planning for succession has been exacerbated by the reduction in arts funding over the past eight years and the consequent shrinking of and structural changes to the sector. In particular, we are exploring how we can help to support the careers of independent producers and performing arts curators. We recognize the urgent need to act and we are eager to see change to happen soon so that the next time we count the numbers, they will manifest the equality we truly believe in. Thank you, and happy International Women's Day to us all. Hello, my name is Michael Colgan from The Gate. Uh, back in the late 1970s, when I was running the Dublin Theatre Festival, I began counting the houses. It's what young producers do. Over the time, it became increasingly apparent to me that there were more women in the audience than men. It was then that I coined the phrase, women go to the theatre, men are brought. And when I joined the gate, I began to see that phrase as axiomatic. And when programming, I began to use it as a crutch. The plays I presented were largely for women 
and about women, and as often as possible would have a woman's name or reference in the title. But they weren't written by women. So why was this? Given my mantra, it would have been good for me to have had more plays written by women. But I think the reason is that each theatre has a different ethos, different strengths, and we all have different poverties. The Gate is a theatre principally devoted to the classics. And what do I mean by that? Well, by classical theatre, I mean those plays that have endured time, scrutiny, and different cultures. I'm thinking of Shakespeare, Friel, Beckett, Wilde, Miller, etc. Plays that will always be performed and have been translated into many languages. The harsh reality is that there are a few classic plays written by women. Or rather, and here's the rub, few that have been given the chance to become classics. This inequality does not occur with novels. There clearly are classical female novelists. And more than any other theatre, I'm glad to say that we at The Gate have given a platform to these by way of adaptations. We have adapted the work of Emily Bronte, Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, Daphne du Maurier, and many more. And we will continue that work. But we're hopeful that The Gate can find itself in a position where we can give a platform to female playwrights on their journey towards they producing classical work or work that will be recognized as classical. Waking the Feminist has been an eye-opener for us. So how do we achieve this equality? How do we measure it? And for me, more importantly, in what timeline? For my own part, I would favor targets over quotas, but I would also greatly encourage financial incentives. Let's be honest, the quotas in the recent election were achieved because of the government's financial incentives. And I now believe that the Arts Council need to play its role in incentivizing theatres to achieve greater diversity and greater equality. Let there be no mistake, the Gay Theatre has fully signed up to a policy of transparent gender equality. It is our ambition to ensure it sits easily on our stage, off our stage, in our offices, and in our boardroom. We have our problems. We have our restrictions, mostly financial. But we are now on a path to double our efforts to ensure that there will be full equality at the gate. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kean O'Brien, and I'm a feminist. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak for a few moments today on behalf of the staff and board of Project Arts Centre. Later this year, Project Arts Centre is going to celebrate its 50th anniversary, a significant moment for the organisation and for all the artists who've been a part of our story and our legacy over the last five decades. Since its founding 50 years ago, Project's mission has, been holistically, has holistically embraced an inclusive, progressive ethos of equality. However, that does not mean that unconscious bias does not exist within our structures and our programs. Over the past few months, we've been working on a new strategy for Project Arts Centre. As part of this process, I've asked myself a lot of questions about how we work. I am keenly aware of my position as a leader and programmer and the responsibility that comes with being the head of an organisation. I am conscious of my privilege in the decisions I am making. And from the many stimulating conversations I've had with industry peers over the last four months, it has become clearer and clearer to me that this privilege is most definitely invisible to those who have it. I've been reflecting on our position as one of the country's leading cultural institutions, one which has always placed artists and freedom of creative expression at its core. In looking back at our past, 
our archive and the story of Project Art Centre. I have seen firsthand how the role of women has been underwritten or underrepresented with male voices pushed to the fore. As an organisation that is constantly thinking about the new and the next, it is our duty to explore the policies which need to be in place to create equality and to challenge unconscious underlying assumptions. I look forward to continuing to work with Waking the Feminists over the coming year to ensure that this does not happen to future generations of women artists and that Project Art Centre can remain truly inclusive, progressive and equal. Thank you. Anne Fogarty from the Board of Directors of Rough Magic Theatre Company. Rough Magic is a company with gender balance in its DNA, founded in 1984 by a gender balance partnership of four women and three men, the, the perfect equation. It was, from the very start, a cooperative with diversity built into its aesthetic. In 1993, we ran a competition exclusively for women writers, and two plays were taken to full production from this initiative. Many women have been commissioned to write and have been produced since Rough Magic's beginnings, including award-winning work by Pom Boyd, Hilary Fanning, Gina Moxley, Paula Meehan, Morna Regan, Yona Anderson, Rosemary Jenkinson, and Elizabeth Cootie. Commissions have sprung, however, not from any conscious policy. Quite simply, we are interested in these writers and the stories they have to tell. Are you more likely to be commissioned or employed by Rough Magic because of your agenda? Your gender? No. But our programme favours the stories of women in society because we find them vital and compelling. The company has a tradition of taking an original approach to the subject matter it tackles. It isn't surprising then that the distaff side of history and the contemporary social landscape is our natural landscape. Rough magic statistics show that, if anything, its balance in terms of produced plays has recently favored female writers. The company runs a seeds program, a platform for emerging theatre artists from writers to sound designers to directors. In its selection of participants for this programme, the gender balance has been good, if not quite at actual parity. Why then is there a need for Rough Magic to engage with the advanced programme? Because Rough Magic as a company needs to ensure that its assumptions about its ethics are borne out consistently and are independent from the particular inclination of any one individual. That means formalising what up to now has been instinctive. We need the advanced programme to help us create a systemic policy, but in such a way that the company can sustain its organic progress and the meritocracy that leads to natural gender balance. We feel that it is necessary to keep checking that our ethical position is as good as we suppose. It is also true that in asking questions about gender and equality, we discover many invisible barriers, including the ones in our own heads. Rough Magic has a responsibility to engage with this process because we are not just a production company. Through our Seeds program, we're also an incubator of new talent and the next generation. So our principles need to be beyond reproof because they will impact on the theatre practice of the future. In linking itself with the Waking the Feminists initiative, Rough Magic wants to continue to make a difference. Thank you. I just want to say another big thank you to all the companies for coming and talking about their uh, reactions to Waking the Feminists. And uh, that kind of concludes that section. Oh, gosh, it's the battle of Jericho, Jericho. <laughs>